Hello, and welcome to Traditions of Grace. I'm Pastor Darren Vick, Senior Pastor at Community of Grace Lutheran Church, and I am so delighted you've chosen to join us for worship today. In just a moment, you will be experiencing a traditional worship service that includes elements from our pre-recorded worship services of the past, along with our most recent sermon from our current sermon series. It is my hope that you would know the love of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit as we worship together. And now, welcome to worship. Let's begin our service by lifting our voices before the Lord today. As we enter into this time of confession and forgiveness, we do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. According to 1 John chapter 1, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And trusting in that promise, I ask now that we take some time for some silent reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. 
We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear this good news that the Almighty God in his mercy sent Jesus to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. In the authority of Scripture and by the power of, by the, power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I tell you by his promise that what you have confessed has most surely been forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please remain standing for our hymn of praise.
CGLC Communications Coordinator Kay back here. Thanks for joining me today wherever you are. I've been missing you and I'm looking forward to connecting with you again soon. Till then, here are some things you should know about. Online registration for our Flying Junction Summer Mini Camps is now underway. We have some exciting classes being offered with names like Bling Brigade, Dance Tracks, and Planters Peak. The camps begin July 13th and meet once a week for four weeks. Check the descriptions and pick the one that best suits your child and your schedule. Reach out to Children's Ministry Director Britta Molly if you would like to volunteer for one of the camps. Then we've come up with a plan for our summer journey off the map. Everything from grace gatherings to more drive-in worship and even indoor and outdoor services on the CGLC campus. You can find details on our current sermon series webpage. And finally, to ensure our building is a safe and healthy facility, we have developed a COVID-19 preparedness plan. Our goal is to mitigate the potential for transmission of the virus in our place of worship and communities, and that requires the full cooperation among our staff and congregation. The plan is posted in the comments, and you can find it and details of everything we have going on at gracepeople.church. I'm looking forward to seeing you all real soon. Till then, stay safe, CGLC. The reading for today is taken from the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 9 through 11. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Good morning, Community of Grace. It's good to be with you today. Uh, it's been a while since I've had a chance to share the Lord's Word with you, but uh, it's been a good season of uh, encouraging our pastoral intern who is now graduated in Kevin Sheldon, uh, bringing us a sermon series and, and listening to God's Word through many different voices. And we can do that. It's good for us to do that and to hear the way that God is speaking to us. Well, you heard part of the story here uh, during our kids' message today. And if you were paying attention, you're going to hear some similar things because we're talking about a journey, a journey that began back in 1803. 1803 was the year that there was a large acquisition of land known as the Louisiana Purchase. And President Thomas Jefferson needed a group of people to go out and explore this land, find out what it was all about, meet the different people along the route, but most importantly, to chart the way to the source of the Missouri River. So, Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark were called to bring together a group of people to take this journey, a group that would be known as the Corps of Discovery. What a great name, Corps of Discovery. And they headed off to St. Louis, where they caught up on the Missouri River where it meets the Mississippi and began their journey along the Missouri River. Now, Lewis and Clark, in what would be known, of course, to us as the Lewis and Clark Expedition, they were expert explorers. They were also expert cartographers. They were good at mapping things out. They knew the lay of the land and how to survive off the land. And they were experts at navigating waterways and needing to find not only the source of the Missouri River, but hoping that the source of the Missouri River would be just a stone's throw from another river called the Columbia River. Because it was already known that the Columbia River went right on into the Pacific Ocean. Now, they had some maps, but the maps as they got further to the west were more and more cloudy. 
They weren't quite sure what the navigation points looked like, and so they were going to rely more and more on the people who were around them and on the various tribes along the way to help them discover how they were going to get to the Columbia River once they reached the source of the Missouri. Now, interestingly enough, the word Missouri is a Native American word, and it means people of the wooden canoes. So the people who were making their way on this journey along the Missouri were the people of the wooden canoes. Here it was Lewis and Clark and the, the core of discovery making this journey. Now what they anticipated finding as they got out there towards the source of the Missouri was a gradual increase in the land, smoothly, slowly reaching its way up to maybe some low-slung mountains. They had heard rumors that there might be mountains out there, but of course the only mountains that Lewis and Clark had seen were the Appalachian Mountains. If you've ever been out to the Appalachian Mountains, you know that they are really just kind of really big hills. So that's what they anticipated to find. But as they made their way west, journeying further and further and further, they saw off in the distance something very different. They saw another mountain range, a mountain range bigger than anything they had ever seen before. And as they continued to navigate the waterways, hoping that the waterways would eventually still make their way to the other side, they came across this vision from the top of the hill. This was not some small mountain range. This was 100 plus miles of tall peaks and steep valleys. Waterways that led up into these mountains, falls and rapids and all kinds of ways that the water was coming to them. They navigated as far as they could in the canoes until they reached a point of decision a point where they had to decide, what are we going to do? Because it was clear that there was no waterway that was going to get us to the other side. They were front confronted with the choice to return home or to press on. Today, we've seen a lot of sudden changes. I think all of us can say that uh, it's been breathtaking to experience what we've experienced as a culture not only in the last few months, but especially now in these last few weeks. Things that we never saw coming. Obviously, things like a worldwide pandemic and social upheaval. Things that come along once in a generation, for many once in a lifetime. But these aren't the only changes that we've been experiencing. There have been more gradual changes that we have been seeing throughout our entire adult lives. At least, I can say that for myself. We've watched as the church, which used to be the center point of the culture, has drifted further and further to the margins. We've witnessed as people who used to claim themselves as Christians and followers of Jesus have more and more and more been identifying as no religious affiliation whatsoever. That drift has been slow but continuous. And we have tried as hard as we can as churches and as congregations all across the United States to figure out how can we fix this problem? How can we restore the strength of the church? How can we get back to the way things used to be? But there's a problem. <laughs> We're used to navigating rivers. We are people of the canoes. I can describe myself as that easily. The kind of seminary training I received, the kind of seminary training that Pastor Angie received, and many other contemporary pastors of our time, we were taught to lead congregations like Community of Grace in regular circumstances, to put together marvelous services and great programs that people would flock to and come from all around. And Community of Grace prior to that as First Lutheran Church was among the best, always has been, a strong congregation filled with dedicated people who were used to the conventional way of doing things. But here we are. We're at the mountains. Everything looks different. What do we do? Do we turn back? and just hang on to that which is familiar? Or do we press on into the unknown? Well, I think we need to turn to God's word 
to see what these mountains ahead of us really look like. Because the way that we see these mountains has a lot to do with how we are to respond as God's people. So if you would, open your Bibles today to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to begin reading at verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 12. Listen to these words. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further would be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountains, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. That's the first mountain, the mountain of fear. And you know what? It's easy for us to take on that spirit of fear. It's easy to look at what's happening around us and and have it be a crushing sense of, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? The world is on fire. Things are coming apart at the seams. We need to move forward carefully and cautiously. We must cling to what we have. We are afraid. But God's word says to not be afraid. And it speaks of a mountain of fire. A mountain that is burning and filled with storm and with a voice that made people tremble with fear. What was that mountain? Well, that mountain was Mount Sinai. And as we go back into the Old Testament, we see God's people being led out of Egypt by Moses, freed from their bondage, moving forward into the wilderness until they came to this mountain, the mountain upon which God would speak to his people. And in particular, God would make his presence known in a cloud above the mountain. And this is what God did. He appeared on the mountain with signs and wonders, with thunder and lightning, with a booming sound of his voice. And God's people at the base of the mountain were terrified. They said, we can't handle this. We can't listen to this. Instead, Moses, you go talk to God. We'll stay down here at the bottom of the mountain, but you go listen to God and come back and tell us what he says. You know, it reminds me of uh, a show that was on a long time ago called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Any of you who remember that might remember Marlon Perkins. Marlon Perkins, the great adventurer who would sit back in his van and say things like, I'll be here in my van drinking this cup of coffee while Jim is out tackling the giant alligator. (laughs) That was the idea of God's people. They were afraid and at the base of the mountain. But Moses didn't come right back. Moses was gone for a long time. And that fear of God's people started to shift to something else. That fear shifted to grumbling. Grumbling. Where is Moses? Is this God really serious? Does Moses really even know what he's doing? You know, they got frustrated over time. And as they got frustrated over time, they started to look to their own ways of solving the problem. Ways that had been experienced by those around them for years. Remember, they had come from the nation of Egypt. And Egypt had many, many gods, many pagan gods, offerings made in worship to all these different types of gods. So these people of the one true God had experienced all of that. And here they were at the base of this frightening mountain. Moses is gone And as they grumble to themselves, they start to grumble to their leaders. And the grumbling goes like this. You know what? We're not so sure about that Moses guy. We're not sure that he's even ever going to come back. So, hey, Aaron, we've got an idea. Help us figure this out. We know what the gods were like where we came from. So why don't you give us a god like that to follow? Give us a God that doesn't speak to us in a voice that fills us with fear or commands us to do his will. Instead, give us an idol that we can command to do our will. That if we will do the things we want around that idol, we'll get what we want. 
And that's what Aaron did. He collected all of the gold of the people, threw it into the fire, melted it down, and then fashioned it into the golden calf. And the people began to dance around the golden calf, worshiping the idol that was before them. Until Moses came down from the mountain. And as Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, his heart was broken because God's heart was broken for the people who had moved so distantly from him and gone back to their old ways. The mountain of fear can lead to a grumbling, and the grumbling can lead to idolatry. That's not the mountain that we've come to, though. That's not the mountain that Scripture says that we are at. Instead, Scripture says that we are at a different mountain. And this mountain is described beginning at verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This isn't a mountain of fear. This is a mountain of joy. It's a mountain that God invites his people to, a mount that is called Mount Zion. And we see about Mount Zion all throughout the Bible as well, but most especially towards the end. In the book of Revelation, many people view the book of Revelation with fear and trembling. They look at the different words and they go, oh my goodness, things are going so badly. We must be fearful of, of the mark of the beast. We must be fearful of, of all these events that are predicted to happen. But they miss the point. Because the point of Revelation is this. God wins. God wins. And in his winning, he invites people to Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem, the place where the angels are singing, the place where the nations are gathered around the throne of God, praising him continuously, a new beginning, a fresh start. That's Mount Zion, a place where God's word is spoken to his people, a word of joy, a word of hope. We come to that mountain. That's the mountain that we are called to be at, friends. A mountain of joy. Because from that mountain of joy, we receive hope. Hope that there is a future. Hope that God has a plan. Hope that God knows what he is doing even when the things around us are completely unknown and when we have walked off of our map. That's you and me. We've walked off our map, friends. I'm not sure what the future looks like. We can think that it might look something like the past, we might be surprised at what God is up to, but so much of it depends on what our attitude towards this circumstance is. Are we going to be a people of fear, or are we going to be a people of joy? I believe God wants us to be a people of joy, a people who look to the mountains with a spirit of adventure. We're called to be the people who go into the mountains and off the map. The mountains are here, friends. There's no avoiding them. So how are we going to move forward into these mountains as God's people? Well, we want to move forward with a spirit of adventure and a spirit of experimentation, a spirit that's willing and open to try some things and maybe fail at some things. We have a unique opportunity in this season to be the people of God who experience God on his mountain a mountain of joy, a mountain of forgiveness, a mountain where Jesus has established something new for you and for me and is calling us forward, calling us forward into an adventure. Will it be hard? Absolutely. We've already experienced some of the difficulty, but we have a unique opportunity right now to step into these new mountains. And I want to recommend three ways that we 
as God's people here at Community of Grace Lutheran Church can step forward with this spirit of adventure. And I've drawn these three things from a book called Canoeing the Mountains, which I've mentioned to you before. It's available on Amazon. I would encourage any one of you to read it. But it lists these three key things to stepping into the mountains as God's people. And the first thing is this. Stay calm. Stay calm. Friends, everything around us is begging us to be embroiled in fear, to be embroiled in fighting, to be embroiled in anger and division. We are called to be God's people, to trust in God, and to stay calm. One of the fruits of the Spirit in this age of the Spirit is patience. We are called to be God's patient people, patiently listening to him, not listening to all the competing voices that are coming at us from all around the culture, but instead to be willing to step forward with a calm spirit, a spirit of trusting in God, calmly moving forward when everybody else is losing their cool. So first, we're called to stay calm. And then second, stay connected. Now, how do we stay connected when we're so disconnected right now? There's never been a time in my career and never been a time in most of our lives when we have been so separated from worshiping together on a Sunday morning in the presence of one another. And believe me, friends, that's something that I miss just as much as anyone. That beautiful expression of being together as God's people. And it's a wonderful gift and a one that we will certainly experience again. But here's the thing. What God is calling us to right now is to be reminded that we are not the people of the building. We are the body of Christ. We are something that is alive. We move and have our being in Jesus himself who calls us to move and go out into the world with a spirit of adventure and with the hope that only Jesus can bring. This is the call of the church. This is the opportunity for us to be something that we have Longed to be, it's one of our core values, to be the church in the world. So how can we do that and stay connected? Well, we're starting something. We're starting something new. It's an experiment, and we're calling them grace gatherings. What's a grace gathering? Well, a grace gathering is a place where people of Community of Grace Lutheran Church can gather in their neighborhoods, can gather together for worship, can gather together for prayer and mutual understanding and building one another up, to stay connected to one another as the body of Christ, to listen to God's word, to gather perhaps around the sermon or around the message of Sunday and listen to it together, or to listen to it separately and then gather together at a later time. These are groups of 15 people who get together around God's word. It's like the early church who gathered together around the apostles' teaching and around prayer and around the breaking of bread and around the serving of their neighbor. This gives an opportunity for us to experiment with something that we really haven't tried before because we've never had this opportunity before. These opportunities sometimes come to us through challenges. They come to us through things that are shaking But we can step forward into this boldly and see what God is up to by being the church in the world as well as being the church gathered together in worship. So you're going to hear more about that, and some of you are going to be called to host these grace gatherings. You can host them in your home. You can host them in a park. You can host them in all sorts of different places, but the key is that you are gathering together as a group of God's people, as the church in the world seeing what is happening around you in your neighborhoods, being prepared to be the light into the darkness that so deeply needs to hear the hope of Jesus Christ. So stay calm, stay connected, and then stay the course. There's a lot of distractions. There are a lot of things that will pull us off into ditches in this world right now. We need to stay the course that Jesus has laid out for us. How do we know what that course is? Well, we trust our guide. Our guide 
is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit given to us as our guide, as the helper, as the one who comes alongside of us as the church to keep moving forward, to keep listening. It's the wind of the Holy Spirit that fills our sails, that challenges us to go into uncharted territory, to walk off the map knowing that God knows exactly what he is doing. None of the things that we are facing right now come as a surprise, Lord. They, none of them come as a surprise to God. God has seen this from the beginning, and he knows how he wants his church to step into this new territory. I'm excited that today is a day that we are celebrating our graduating seniors. Because the seniors who are graduating today have had brackets around the years of their lives that nobody else in history has had. They were born into the age of 9-11. That's the year that many of these graduating seniors were called in to life. 9-11, which reshaped the entire world. The world would never be the same after that time. We still see things and hear the reverberations of it to this very day. And here they come to the end of their high school journey, graduating in 2020, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of social upheaval, robbed of some things that many of us took for granted. But I have great hope, because when I see people like Noelle Norman and her faithfulness to God, when I see her peers and others who are stepping in to this uncharted territory. I know that God has great things in mind for his church. If we will stay calm, if we will stay connected, and if we will stay the course, some of these young people will become leaders. Many of them already are. Some of them will have voices that we need to listen to as God calls us into this uncharted land. Because for some of them, they're much more familiar with the territory than we are. We need to listen to what God is saying. And there's a lot of shaking going on. But we can live into that shaking that's going on too. Because the rest of this passage from the book of Hebrews, starting at verse 25, says this. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks, if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has pronounced, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Things are shaking, but God's kingdom is unshakable. And we are being stirred, stirred by the Holy Spirit, to step out into this new uncharted land with a spirit of adventure. Let's have grace with one another, since it's in our name, to explore the uncharted territory, to be patient as God leads us forward, to connect with one another in unique and creative ways, and to stay the course following our leader who we can trust to lead us to the place that he desires us to go in mission to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm excited to be on this journey with you. And I ask for your prayers, as all of us in leadership do, that we would be keen to listen to what the Spirit is saying. We would be quick to follow. We would be quick to repent when we make mistakes. And we would have a spirit of adventure that lets us try things, and if they fail, try again. It's that season, friends. An exciting season lies ahead. So let me encourage you, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be learning some skills that we're going to need to journey through the mountains, some things that might be unfamiliar to some of us, and we're going to be following along from a book called Surprise the World 
by Michael Frost. It's a simple, small book. You can pick it up again on Amazon.com. We're also going to buy some copies of this so that you can come up to the church and purchase one for yourself to read through. We're going to learn some ways that we are called to live into this surprising world as God's surprising people, living a missional heart to those around us. I plan to learn. I want you to learn with me and with our other teachers as we go on this journey together. We can do this, friends, because God is with us. Let's stay calm. Let's stay connected. Let's stay the course. And let's stay in the spirit as we do this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess, Lord, that as we look at the mountains in front of us, it is easy for us to be filled with the spirit of fear. Lord, I know that countless times over the last several weeks and months, I have been overcome with that spirit of fear. I have felt the pressure and the pressing of things changing so quickly and not knowing what the future would hold. And I admit, Lord, that I am unprepared to be a mountain climber. But Lord, I trust you. And we trust you, Lord. We know that you have gone ahead of us. You know the terrain. You know the dangers. And you have prepared a path for us to follow you and trust you, even when things are hard. And we know, Lord, that you will guide us to the other side of the mountains. And when we get there, Lord, we will be changed. We will be a different people than the ones who started this journey. And Lord, that's frightening to think there may be things that we leave behind in order to press on in following you. Lord, give us grace on this journey. Give us grace to recognize that sometimes the things we have to let go of, while they feel like a loss, Lord, in your kingdom are a gain. Help us, Lord, to be gracious towards one another to see each other with eyes of compassion as we see the world around us that is also shaken and in turmoil and divided and broken, to be people who bring healing through your word, who bring healing through prayer, who set the pace and the path forward as followers of you, Jesus, humbly going where you lead us. Thank you, Lord. We trust you. We believe in you, and we will go where you lead us as we are sent by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I invite you to join me in professing our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as our worship continues with the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
So now as you make your way out today, go with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon your life with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord.